Hey, everybody. You are about to hear a brief retelling of the movie Dune, Part 2. Before we get started, hit the like button and subscribe. It may only be a click for you, but it has a significant impact on the channel. In the year 10191, humanity was able to travel through space thanks to a valuable substance known as spice, which can only be found on the planet Arrakis. The inhabitants are referred to as freemen and are mistreated by the Empire because aristocrats have come to the planet to colonize and control the supply of spice. For many years, the Harkonnen family ruled Arrakis, but one day the Emperor threw them out and the Atriides family assumed control. However, the Harkonnens never stop scheming retaliation and finally launch an attack on Arrakis to reclaim world leadership. The majority of the Atriides family is slaughtered, with the exception of son Paul and his mother Jessica, who flee to the desert and meet with the freemen. Jessica belongs to the Bene Gesserit, a group that has covertly created a prophecy that leads some freemen to believe Paul is the chosen one who would save them from the Empire. Paul proves himself in a fight, and the freemen offer to transport them to their settlement. However, everyone else in the cosmos believes that the Atriides family is extinct. Vladimir, the leader of the Harkonnen family, praises his nephew Rabin for completing the assignment by giving him control of Arrakis spice production. When Paul's group hears that a spaceship has dropped a number of Harkonnen soldiers, they scramble to hide. They leave a body behind his bait, and as the soldiers approach, a thumper starts yelling for the gigantic worms. The Harkoners detect the noise and deduce the plan, so they fly to the nearest rock formation. At that point, an eclipse darkens the sky, allowing the Freemen to shoot at the troops from a distance with their laser rifles. When one of the soldiers comes down to check on the fallen dead, Paul runs to seize a blade and begins battling the man, displaying impressive abilities before killing him. A second soldier approaches behind Paul, but Jessica quickly beats him to death with a rock. After the conflict, the Freemen remove all the water from the dead bodies. Jessica suddenly vomit up, and the others assume she is disgusted by the sight, but she is actually pregnant. Then all of the soldiers' bodies are stacked up, and the Freemen summon a gigantic worm to devour them. Meanwhile, Rabin is told to relocate his troops away from Freeman territory since they are losing too many troops there. Rabin is furious and begins beating up his assistant while saying that they are losing guys to rats. Eventually, Paul's company arrives at Freeman's settlement. Many people are unhappy to see Paul and are suspicious of him, but some townspeople accept the prophecy and worship him. Stilgar attempts to persuade the council that Paul is the chosen one, but they do not take him seriously. Paul and Jessica are still fed, and the spice in the meal causes Paul to have a vision that he cannot comprehend. Jessica is then summoned to see the rite in which they collect water from the warrior Paul murdered and pour it into a lake in the cave. Stilgar reveals that this is just one of thousands of water caches built by the Freemen to help terraform the planet. Then he adds that their reverend mother is dying and they would like Jessica to take her place. Jessica accepts because she wants to help Paul. She is carried to a cave where the reverend mother touches her face while the Freemen outside pray. The Freemen then give her the water of life, saying that the poison frees the soul, kills her, and allows her to see again. Jessica takes a sip and immediately has a convulsion as the fetus inside her changes. As her eyes turn blue, the Reverend Mother knows she is pregnant and declares the right a mistake. Following the death of the Reverend Mother, there is a dispute among the Freemen. Some believe Jessica's pregnancy was a miracle that proved the prophecy, while others believe the prophecy is a hoax fabricated by the big families and that their messiah should not be an outsider. Paul interrupts the struggle to explain that his mother was taught to survive poisons, therefore it was not a miracle. He also claims that he has no desire to lead and merely wishes to fight with them, but his humility only strengthens Stilgar's conviction that he is the chosen one. When Jessica wakes up, she informs Paul that the baby can now communicate with her and that he should also drink the water. Later, Paul is given a tent and some food to go into the desert and learn the Freeman's ways. Paul walks cautiously on the sand, but he's not very good at it, so Cheney joins him and shows him how to improve his technique. She also teaches him a lot about the desert and being a freeman, and as they spend more time together, they begin to fall for one another. In town, Jessica continues to talk to her baby and plans how to persuade the non-believers to change their opinions. A few days later, a harvester arrives in the desert to gather spices. The freemen emerge from their hiding places in the sand for a surprise attack, killing a swarm of soldiers while moving expertly on the sand, giving them an advantage. The enemy has also sent an airplane, which opens fire on them, so the freemen run to find refuge beneath the harvester. Cheney and Paul appear and bring out two more soldiers, then, Paul serves as bait to draw the aircraft's attention to him, and Chan takes it down with her laser pistol. More freemen can now come out of concealment and shoot at the harvester simultaneously, eventually destroying it. That night, the group celebrates their win and embraces Paul as a member of the freemen. They give him a warrior name and hug him as a formal greeting. The next day, Paul witnesses Stilgar ride a worm and removes his family ring, acknowledging that he is no longer an Atriides. Then Cheney joins him and they exchange kisses. For the following few months, the party travels through the desert, destroying any harvester they come across, gradually causing significant losses to Harkonnen. 
When Vladimir learns of all the turmoil, he murders two assistants in rage. He summons Rabin to his apartments and warns him that if they continue to fail, the Emperor will remove Spice from their authority. Rabin must put things right or he will face punishment. Returning to Paul, he awakens from another nightmare. He tries to tell Cheney about it, but he can't recall much. He sees himself following a woman into battle while hundreds of people die around him. Cheney tells him that strange dreams are only a result of being exposed to Spice for so long. Then Paul prepares for the Freeman's Rite of Passage, which involves summoning and riding a sandworm. Paul tests the sand in a few locations until he finds the ideal area and lays down a thumper. Soon, a larger-than-usual worm comes, but Paul is unafraid. He hops on top of it and, using some hooks, manages to grasp onto the worm before falling off. After some struggle, he finds the appropriate position and joins the hook to begin riding the worm properly, earning the respect of the Freeman. Everyone celebrates for him, yet some bow as part of the prophecy. The news rapidly reaches Jessica, who encourages her followers to disseminate the word. She chooses to travel to the south and gain adherence there, but Paul does not accompany her. When he says goodbye, he discovers she's the woman from his nightmares. Sometime thereafter, the Freeman attack a spice storage, destroying 80% of the enemy's crop. Rabin is enraged and rallies his forces before flying to the desert to hunt down the Freeman. They can't see them, but Rabin orders his soldiers to shoot down the rocky formation nevertheless, resulting in a massive explosion and a dense dust fog. Then Rabin and his soldiers abandon their ships and walk through the fog, allowing the Freeman to encircle them and slaughter them one by one. Rabin and his crew flee, terrified, but the Freeman begin shooting at the plane as well. Rabin barely holds on and nearly dies in the process, but a guard shoots the attacker off the ship, allowing them to escape. Meanwhile, the Emperor is concerned about the Freeman gaining power, and his daughter Princess Irulan advises him to let the conflict escalate into a full-scale war. Later, in private, Irulan informs Reverend Mother Helen that she believes Paul is the Freeman's next prophet. Helen verifies it, but warns her not to tell anybody, especially the Emperor, because if the Great Houses find out about the Atriides family massacre, her father would lose the kingdom. She's also preparing for the Emperor's nephew Fade to take rule Arrakis. Speaking of Fade, he prepares for a fight by testing his new blade on a servant, quickly murdering her while still moaning about the sharpness. At the same time, his opponents receive a mystery injection, revealing that they are three Atriides family inmates. Then Fade enters the arena, where Vladimir and hundreds of others have gathered to see him fight on his birthday. He kills two of his three opponents in a matter of seconds, but the third was not poisoned and fights fairly. Fade believes he is being tested, so he removes his bot shield to demonstrate and continues to battle the prisoner, asking the guards not to help him. His opponent does his best, but Fade is still a better fighter, and Fade kills him as well, earning an ovation from the audience. Later that day, Fade complains to Vladimir about the ploy, but Vladimir informs him that he passed the test and may take Arrakis. Vladimir also states that he intends to overthrow the Emperor and wants Fade to take over. While waiting to go, he discovers Margot, a Bene Gesserit member, following him. Fade discovers he's seen her in his fantasies, and Margot tricks him into following her to her room, where they get dirty together. The following day, Margot notifies Helen and Irulan that the bloodline has been established because she is pregnant with Fade's kid, as planned. At the same moment, Vladimir declares Fade the new governor of Arrakis. In the desert, a group of smugglers land a harvester to collect spice, but the freemen instantly activate hidden mines and begin fire, destroying all of their equipment. Paul charges at one of the smugglers, but he pauses when he recognizes Gurney, the war master who used to work for his family. Paul instructs the others not to attack anymore and gives his old friend a hug. Following that, Gurney and his men begin traveling with Paul's gang. Gurney advises Paul to utilize his power to dominate the Freeman and exact revenge, but Paul is afraid of doing so because his visions lead to a holy war with millions of fatalities. Gurney subsequently discloses that he knows where the Atriides family's whole arsenal of weapons is hidden. Paul begins to see things differently because all of his power may help him secure freedom for the Freeman. They inform the others and proceed to the underground cave, where only Paul's DNA opens the door. Inside they find 92 atomic warheads. Meanwhile, Jessica travels to the south and continues to spread the word about Paul's achievements. She also meets with the Maker Keeper, who demonstrates how the water of life is made. Inside a temple, the Keeper summons the newborn sandworm, which she drowns in a tiny lake before extracting its poison. When the poison is finished, Jessica uses her power to compel the Keeper to share the water with Paul when he arrives, which is banned. Later, Paul discovers Cheney staring at the sun and notices her face is scorched. Suddenly, he awakens to see every one of the Freemen staring around because they hear explosions. It comes out that Fade is attacking their village, knocking it down with powerful artillery fired from aircraft. When Rabin arrives, he confronts his brother Fade about stealing his place, but Fade knocks him down and compels him to kiss his feet. Then Fade meets Cheney's friend, who was taken during the attack, but she is slain since she refuses to offer any information. Returning to Paul's group, they race back to their village to assist the few individuals who survived the onslaught. 
They receive word from the South that the leaders are meeting to examine the situation, but Paul refuses to attend because he is scared of his visions. When he touches the sand, he experiences the same terrifying visions, but Cheney tells him that they have no choice if they want to survive. The entire troop rides sandworms and eventually makes their way south. Paul enters the temple, and the keeper hands him the water of life, which he takes without hesitation. He envisions his future sister standing on a beach, telling him the truth about their family. By the time the remainder of the gang gets to the temple, Paul's vital signs are so low that he appears dead. Cheney is outraged and tells Jessica that she should repair it, but Jessica uses her power to force Cheney to complete the rite. Cheney blends her tear with a small amount of the water of life and puts it on Paul's lips to wake him up. Everyone bows because they believe this is a miracle, but Cheney slaps Paul and leaves in a huff. Later, in private, Paul explains to Jessica that he can see all futures and understand the past. He has also seen his complete ancestry and discovered that Jessica is Vladimir's daughter. Jessica claims she didn't know until she drank the water. Paul declares that if they are Harkonnens, they will fight as such, signaling the start of Paul's descent from savior to tyrant. Paul then goes to the war council, where all the freemen are praying. Cheney tries to convince them that they are being duped by the prophecy and that everything will end poorly, but no one believes her. As Paul approaches the center of the room, the villagers debate whether Stilgar should die so that Paul can assume his place as leader, but Paul shouts at them for wanting to get rid of such a great fighter. Then he delivers a magnificent speech, describing himself as a prophet and stunning everyone by stating details from a random person's past that he only knows because of the water. Everyone is impressed and falls to their knees once more, finally recognizing Paul as their permanent leader. Then Paul puts on his father's ring again, claiming to be the Duke of Arrakis and promising to provide the Freeman a green paradise. Everyone except Cheney yells his name and prepares to battle for him. Moments afterward, Paul sends the Emperor a telegram challenging him for the throne. In private, Helen informs Irulan that her father will lose the throne regardless of who wins, but her family can continue in power if Irulan marries the victor. The Emperor's army eventually lands at Arrakis. Paul devises a plan with the Freeman, reminding them to capture the Emperor alive. Vladimir witnesses the arrival and instructs Fade to notify all of the major houses. The Emperor soon meets with Vladimir and his nephews to demand information, but because Vladimir is unaware of what is going on in the south, the Emperor orders a guard to chastise him. At that moment, the Freemen unleash fire, smashing the enemy's shields with their atomic warheads and forcing sand to blow around, offering shelter. They also set up a number of thumpers to call an army of worms, which they ride into combat and slaughter hundreds of soldiers at once. Many Freemen emerge from the sand as well, attacking from behind structures, leaving the opponent trapped on all sides. The soldiers attempt to fight back, but they are unaccustomed to the desert, and their defeat is unavoidable. Soon, the Freemen make their way inside, and Paul goes across the chamber without being seen because they are guarding the Emperor. Paul sees Vladimir trying to crawl away and murders him after calling him grandfather. On his way out, he instructs the others to feed Vladimir's body to the desert and capture everyone. For the next few hours, the combat continues, and the Freemen are plainly prevailing. Rabin attempts to flee, but Gurney apprehends him and kills him in a matter of seconds as retribution for the loss of his duke and friends. The battle concludes that night, and all of the bodies are burned, with the exception of Vladimir's, who is dumped into the sand. The following morning, Paul discovers that the big house's ships are above them, ready to attack. He instructs Gurney to issue a warning, stating that if they do not respect his ascendancy and attack him, their warheads will destroy the spice field. Then Paul proclaims that he would marry Irulan so that they might govern together, but he demands that the Emperor account for the massacre of his family. The Emperor refuses to compromise, so he gives Fade his blade and selects him to represent him in combat. Paul addresses Fade as cousin and the duel begins. Both men are incredible warriors, and the fight is fairly even, but Fade eventually knocks Paul down and mocks him, calling Cheney his pet. Paul refuses to give up and attacks again, and Fade stabs him twice in a few moves. However, Paul had played a deception on Fade by making himself vulnerable in order to pull him close and stab him in the heart, killing him. As the Freeman chant Paul's name, Irulan is forced to accept the marriage and hand over the throne. Paul extends his hand, forcing the Emperor to kiss his ring, prompting everyone to bow. Cheney leaves the room, upset, while Gurney informs them that the great houses have responded by agreeing to honor Paul. In the end, Paul commands Stilgar to transport the Freeman to paradise. Cheney refuses to join them and instead flees to the desert on a worm.